Binary logic is the idea, right, that logic isn't necessarily just true or false. It can also be represented in terms of zeros and ones. When we take our arrays here, let me hide that. When we take our arrays here, x and y, we see that we have a zero and then a one and then a zero and another one, right? This could be represented also by true and false, but zero and one is a little bit shorter, but we can use a little bit of math here. And we can use math to write shorthand or alternative ways of formulating how these arrays interact with each other. Our common disjunction, right, x or y, well, this will return the inclusive or of wherever x or y is true. And so if we stack these arrays on top of each other just for visualization, and then we uh, simplify them or we aggregate them by joining them with an or, we see that, well, in this first column, it's false and false, or false or false evaluates to false, and we see that output here. True or false evaluates to true, and we see that output here. False or true, same thing, so on and so forth. What is very interesting about this binary logic, since these values can be represented by real numbers, we can get the same exact output if we add these two arrays together. And what's interesting here is that Boolean array addition is the same thing as asking x or y. x plus y is the same thing as x or y, right? If these are represented by numbers, zero plus zero, well, that's still zero. One plus zero, that's one, so that's true now. Zero plus one, well, that's one. And in Boolean logic here, one plus one, Technically, mathematically, right, that does equal two, but in this case, it stays a one because our Boolean arrays are bounded between zero and one. Any number greater than one evaluates to one. And so we can use that idea to obtain the disjunction, right, between two arrays. With that being said, how do we represent the conjunction of two arrays? Well, we can use the bitwise uh, operator AND here first. An AND expression will only evaluate to true if both of its inputs are true. So if A and B or X and Y are both true. And so that's why we get this false, 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 true kind of truth table output here. How would we represent this mathematically though? Well, instead of using an addition, we would use a multiplication. Zero times zero is zero. One times zero, also zero. Zero times one, also zero. And one times one, well, that comes out to one. And so we have this idea that within our binary logic, we can represent uh, ands and ors with multiplication and addition respectively. And that means that the disjunction, the conjunction of these two arrays are also right, represented by mathematical operations and not just some mystical kind of computer logic, right? These are actual real math mathematical operations that we're applying here. But how can we use this to our advantage? Well, one of my favorite ways of using this is to reduce intermediates when you're processing some data. If I have a data frame that has two columns here, A and B, we can actually, and our goal here is to maybe filter that data frame, if we wanted to subset our data based on whether our column B is exactly equal to Q and our column A is less than three, well, we could write it like this. We could have an intermediary, uh, inter intermediate uh, product of this tem temporary data frame. And I know if you've done data analysis at one point you have had temp df or something of that nature. I know many people who have df1, df2, df3 that are all either subsets, hopefully they're not subsets, but different derivations of them. And if we're working in things like notebooks, we don't want these intermediate outputs that can be quite large to be existing at runtime in permanency. Because when you're working in a notebook, nothing is deleted unless it's explicitly deleted by you. So what this means is, if we have this temporary data frame where we filtered B by Q, we get this next output, right? We only have rows that correspond to where B is equal to the letter Q. Now we subset that temporary data frame again, and we say, well, now give me all the rows that are three. And we've used this kind of intermediate output in order to achieve some final result. 
And again, I know if you've done data analysis, you've definitely had a final DF. We have this final result here. But what if this temporary structure was large? What if it was hogging up a lot of memory or resources and we're not going to use it ever again, right? I guess if I was working in an environment that didn't enable the garbage collector, well, I could just delete it and that, you know, that would work more or less successfully. But there is a better way. You can use this idea of masking to create masks and join them, but I'll show you one more example of where this type of intermediate output product goes horribly wrong. And if you've ever used pandas, you know about the setting with copy warning. And so if you've ever encountered this, then you have used pandas essentially. And so you can see when I create this temporary output of data frame Q, right, that's a subset of our original data frame, and I go to apply either another masking operation or assign some type of column or value to it, I get the setting with copy warning. And this is a warning that we have all seen, we have all experienced. How do I circumvent this? Well, one way is to essentially declare your subset to be fully independent of its original source. Which begs the question, well, why did we get this warning in the first place? We got this warning because we applied a slice-based operation onto our data frame, we subsetted it, and Pandas isn't sure. When we, when we go to update this subset, do we want that to propagate back to the original data frame, or do we want data frame Q to just be a fully independent subset of its data frame. This is essentially telling us, hey, you might have been expecting to be working with a view here, but you're not, so I'm going to warn you that you're not. Because if you're expecting our original data frame to have a column called new call and have values equal to hello, that's not going to be the case. So what we can do, is we can simply copy our subset, and this will allow us to independently work with data frame Q as a fully independent um, result from our original data frame. See, when we do this, we get rid of our setting with copy warning. But what if I do want those changes to propagate back to the original data frame? How would I do that? How would I, how would I create a mask that had both Q or column B equal to Q and column A less than three. I think I just said it out loud. Column B equal to Q and column A less than three. And so what we can do here is we can use just a little bit of logic. If we create our data frame and we create two mask objects, and I'll show you what these look like. These are just Boolean series, right? Both of them are Boolean series, and they're Boolean in different ways or different uh, perform uh, areas. And so what we can do here is if I take my subset, right, the Q subset, which is true for the first three rows and false for the last two rows, and then I take my other rule here of where A has to be less than three, right, and I combine these two masks of Q subset and ALT's three sub uh, column it, with a conjunction then I get the mask for my original data frame to evaluate everything to true or just subset based on this mask. And now I'm not using any intermediate, any large intermediate products. The only intermediate products I'm doing are creating Boolean series, which even if you have many, many rows are quite cheap to make because Booleans only have a possible value set of zero or one, meaning we don't need a lot of space to create these and to maintain these. It's much cheaper than propagating the entire data set as an intermediate product. And so what we can do is we can say, well, now give me my data frame, right? Take both of these arrays, take both these Boolean series objects, combine them into a single mask by taking their conjunction here, and we'll get the first two rows out of our original data frame. And so you can see here, we can use this idea of masks, of Boolean logic, creating masks, and then joining those masks in order to create a final product. How else does Boolean logic apply? Well, 
or sorry, how else does logic apply in Python? Well, we see this also in set logic. If I had a set named A and a set named Q, I can join these and combine these in many different ways. We can see that I can do P and Q, which is their conjunction, right? This is what exists in P and also what exists in Q. Where do they overlap? If this were a Venn diagram, it would be the center section. I can also get obtain their disjunction, right? Give me everything that is in P or Q or in the center, right? This is an inclusive or. So give me essentially the union of these two sets. Well, what about exclusive or? I can use the bitwise XOR or exclusive or in Python here, uh, which is represented by a caret, and this gives you the symmetric difference. It gives me what's in A that's not in B, or what's in P that's not in Q, and what's in Q that's not in P, right? So we get the symmetric difference here. It's essentially the inclusive or, but remove the overlapping items. And then we can do a single-sided difference as well using set logic. This last item is saying, give me everything that's in P that's not also in Q. And so you can see here that P is comprised of A, B, and C. Q has B and it has C, so we're only left with the result of A. But what else behaves this way? It's not just Python sets that behave this way. We can actually use the keys of a dictionary to create sets, right? So if you say, give me all the keys and do a left-handed subtraction of, a, of just A, or you can do this actually with any iterable. So if I were to include A and B here as a list, right, we'll get the actual set subtraction of those keys. You can then iterate over these keys, index back into the dictionary. This is a great way of performing some dictionary filtering operations. As of Python 3.9, um, PEP, this one's PEP 584. Uh, you can actually perform a union on a dictionary. This is a fairly recent addition to Python. And so what you can do here is update a dictionary with a new dictionary. This is a little bit different than a true union because the values of the right-hand side dictionary will override any existing values in the left-hand dictionary, but you end up with a union of your keys. And you'll note that these dictionary behaviors are actually, are actually set behaviors just on their key objects. You can do this with a pandas index. You have the intersection here, which is, um, if I have my index, right, my index is A, B, C, and D, I can say, well, give me all of these items where they overlap with this other uh, iterable of A, D, and F, and we end up with an index that only has A and D because that is their intersection. And you can do things like pandas index difference, symmetric difference, um, and also single-handed um, sided differences as well. Where this becomes useful in pandas, right? If you want to perform a column filtering operation, well, the column object is just an index object. And so it has the dot difference, it has dot intersection, all those operations I just went over. And you can perform filtering very easily on your data frame. And just to show you what that filtering looks like, there's our original data frame. I took the difference, I subtracted away A and D. D doesn't exist, so that doesn't really matter, but I subtracted away column A, and I'm left with uh, all of my other columns. So it's a very powerful way that you can interact with pandas index objects, both the row and column index, since they're the same, to perform very easy uh, pandas subsetting operations. You can also, creates um, complex masks. And all this is, is if I create a data frame here that has every day of the year in 2015, and it has uh, days about eight uh, samples per day, sp spaced about three, parts out, three hours apart, well, I'll show you what a subset of that data looks like. And you can see here my index, um, just eight random samples from here. I have my seasons labeled from winter, spring, summer, fall, winter again, right at the beginning and the end of the year are both winter, and then I have some random values associated with them. What if I wanted to combine masks such that I had this complex idea of where I wanted to get all of the values that were between the hours of 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., right? And I can do that pretty easily in pandas using this dot between time method. But how do I combine that? What if I just want 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. of spring and summer? Well, you can see here I have two different types of masks. 
right here, I just have an index subset by using between time, but on the right hand side, I have this Boolean mask. How would I ever go about combining them? Well, you can use your set logic to essentially perform a combination. And so what I would do, or perform an intersection, I should say, what I would do is I would take all of the rows that are between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. I would take the index from that result, and then I would intersect that index with the index values that were true, whether or not they were in spring and summer. And so what you can do here is use this idea of using indices in pandas along with right, your set intersection, your set difference, depending on what you want your final subset of data to be, and perform very complex subsetting operations without creating unnecessary temporary data frames where you're performing multiple different slices. This is actually derived from the original data. And so, although in this case I am working with a copy, there is a way to create this product such that you are not working with a copy by taking a slice since our, data's, our data are evenly sampled. But you get the idea of how you can perform set-like operations on the Python set, on the Python dictionary, and on the pandas data frame. And that takes us to the end of our time here together. This has been a fantastic time. I've had a wonderful time telling you guys all about everything that I've learned about Boolean logic, about Boolean algebra, and how you can use that to make your Python even better, to simplify your if-else, your control flow, to represent Boolean logic as data structures, to apply this meaningfully with probability theory and with your data frame and pandas operations.